Support for Carolina Business Review made possible by Sunoco, a global manufacturer of consumer and industrial packaging products and provider of packaging services with more than 300 operations in 35 countries, headquartered in Hartsville since 1899. And by Business North Carolina Magazine. There's a place for those who subscribe to the theory that business doesn't have to be boring. Well, remember the words from the 1989 Billy Joel song, We Didn't Start the Fire? We didn't start the fire. It was always burning since the world's been turning. Well, given Middle East events and other parts of the world, it seems prophetic once again. Welcome to the most widely watched source for Carolina business and public policy. I'm Chris William, and thank you again for watching and supporting this broadcast for the last 20 years. On this edition, an executive profile with a favored Southern son, former Georgian state senator, former assistant attorney general, and now the American ambassador to the Republic of Singapore, the Honorable David Edelman. Major funding for Carolina Business Review provided by Grant Thornton, an international accounting, tax, and business advisory organization dedicated to serving middle market companies. Grant Thornton, a passion for the business of accounting. And by Novant Health, a not-for-profit group of hospitals and physician clinics, ranked as one of our nation's 10 best health care systems, caring for patients and communities in North and South Carolina. Major funding also by King and Spalding, an international law firm with over 800 lawyers in 13 offices worldwide, providing legal services to clients in the Carolinas and throughout the world. For more information, visit www.kslaw.com. This edition of Carolina Business Review was recorded February 25th, 2011. On this week's program, an executive profile featuring David Edelman, the U.S. Ambassador to Singapore. Now, Chris William. Hello, welcome to our program, Your Honor. Uh, good to have you here and welcome to the Carolinas. Thank you, Chris. Good to be here. Thank you. Uh, sir, let, let's start with Singapore. Uh, here is an, you know, someone once called this to me recently. They said, Singapore, wow, uh, we've got a headquarters there and it's, we like to think this is an economic Shangri-La, and it's a bit of an anomaly. It's a it's a five million city state, country city, but it's an economic gateway. It seems to Southeast Asia. How would you describe what Singapore means? Well, I think you've got it right. Uh, Singapore is a tiny place. It's the most trade dependent economy uh, in the world, and Singapore, I think, more than any other country in the world, punches above its weight. In this case, punches well above its weight. Let's talk about this a bit. It's uh, um, Politically, you, you took a little heat prior, uh, right after your nomination. You said, you know, you'd love to see a multi-party influence in Singapore uh, from the political standpoint. And Singapore has been, a, a, I think The Economist magazine called it a hybrid regime. Now that you're in country, and you've been in country for almost a year now, what have you noticed about it politically, and what have you noticed about it from a trade and commercial standpoint that maybe was not as apparent from, you know, our vantage point? Well, there really haven't been many surprises. Uh, Singapore is a great friend of the United mm -hmm. States and has been uh, since uh, she gained her independence uh, in the 1960s. Uh, we in the United States uh, generally uh, promote democracy by holding the United States out as an example. Uh, we believe in press freedoms, freedoms of assembly, and, and uh, we promote that simply by holding the United States out as an example. Uh, the type of government Singapore or other countries might have, that's uh, completely up to Singaporeans. Uh, there haven't been uh, any big surprises uh, with regard to that issue at all. I suppose. Uh, to the extent uh, there's been um, any surprise, it's all been pleasant surprises. Mm -hmm. I've been so pleasantly surprised at just how hospitable a business climate Singapore is for American businesses, which explains why there are more than 2,000 U.S. businesses mm -hmm. with significant operations in Singapore. More than 20,000 American uh, expats uh, live in Singapore, uh, usually, uh, in many cases, employed by America's uh, leading businesses. So the, the friendship between the United States and Singapore uh, is deep and, and enduring. And mm -hmm. at some risk, I'll say U.S.-Singapore relations are at an all-time high. 
I'm very happy to report. Well, Your Honor, what, what, what is the U.S. interest there? Besides what you just said, what would you like to see in the next five years or maybe even the next 20? Well, again, it's a very strong relationship. Uh, I would say the foundation of the U.S.-Singapore relationship is security. Mm -hmm. It's our strong military-to-military -military cooperation uh, that, as I've said, began with Singapore's independence. But it's a multifaceted relationship built on that foundation. And I would say the second pillar really is the commercial ties. Although a small country, as you mentioned, of only five million people, I would add only three and a half million of whom are Singaporean. The others are there as expats uh, doing business or for other reasons. Singapore is America's 10th largest trading partner. It's just, it's hard to believe when you look at some of the numbers, and, and, and I know you know this, Your Honor, but you ticked down fourth leading financial center, London, New York, Hong Kong, Singapore. Mm -hmm. As you said prior to the broadcast, their GDP grew at 14 and percent, fastest growing economy. When you look at what Singapore has been able to do, it, it, now you've got the advent of Beijing and Shanghai and some of the other trade and, and, and commercial centers there. So how does Singapore now navigate those waters and continue to keep the influence that they have among not just U.S. corporations, but European and global corporations? How do they make sure that they continue to be that gateway? Well, I think they're doing it. I think we can watch it unfold uh, before our very eyes. They're playing to their strengths. Mm -hmm. Singapore's strengths, at least with regard to uh, remaining attractive to the United States, include English language as their first language, uh, rule of law, extremely important to American businesses, especially with regard to a strong intellectual property uh, regime. Uh, we can't talk about Singapore without talking about their excellent location. They may have the best location on the planet, halfway between India and China, uh, right in the middle of Southeast Asia and the 600 million people who are in the 10 uh, ASEAN, uh, Association of Southeast Asian Nations. Uh, you can reach half the world's population from Singapore uh, with a flight of less than four hours. And most of that you can reach with a flight of less than two hours. So they've got a really good spot. It's no surprise uh, American businesses have recognized that. Well, you talk about the, the, the locale, you've, Australia within striking distance many, in many places. Vietnam now uh, is growing uh, pretty dramatically. So I guess we, let's, let's come back to the, the geopolitical aspect of Singapore. When you hear within your diplomatic calls or you talk to some of your diplomatic colleagues in the Middle East, and, and certainly we all are pained and watch the images that we see and hear on the radio and television, what, what, what advice would you give them or what do you talk about that, that, that you can freely share about what is going on there and, and what are your thoughts about that? Sure. Well, events are unfolding almost every day in northern Africa and, and, and in the Arab world, and, and uh, you know, I'm not there. And so I would never um, be so presumptuous as to substitute my judgment for those uh, uh, excellent diplomats uh, who are in place uh, in those countries. Uh, when, I, when I look at it, when I see the developments in the news, it just reinforces uh, my belief that the world is becoming increasingly interdependent. You know, a lot was made in the 1990s and even more recently about an interconnected world, and that's all true. But I think it's more than just interconnected now. I think the world, and especially the world's economies, are truly interdependent. So we can see an event in a place like Libya or Egypt have a very um, strong and almost direct effect on American businesses and other American institutions right here in North Carolina, for example. Mm -hmm. The price of oil, uh, the ability to export goods, which is what uh, we're talking about during this trip uh, through the state, is all affected uh, by world events. Singapore, because it's so small, is really especially sensitive to global changes. They were one of the first countries into the global recession, and not surprisingly, they were one of the first out of the global recession. As a small, trade-dependent country, uh, which is home to, depending on how you measure it, the first or second busiest port in the world, uh, I think they feel the interdependence uh, as much or more than any country. And when you're 9,000 miles from home representing, mm -hmm. having the honor to represent the United States, you see things that you know a little more clearly. And it's that interdependence, I think, that we um, see playing out 
uh, as a result of the changes uh, in the Arab world. So, so consequently, uh, Your Honor, when you, when you have a dialogue with the Singaporeans, when, when you have political leadership, um, and again, you, I'm sure you won't give up confidences, but when they look at what's happening and the unrest in some of the regimes that are clearly autocratic and, and repressive, I don't think you can say that about Singapore, but you can say it is a hybrid regime as we talked about before. Do they have concerns that whatever that is could spill out into countries like our city, state countries like ours? I don't think so. Uh, the the, the uh, political environment and the economic yeah. environment in Singapore is very difficult, uh, very different, I'm sorry, very different from the difficult uh, environments in places like Libya and Algiers and Tunisia. It's a completely different uh, ball game. Um, for one example, Singapore has um, full employment. Uh, as a matter of fact, it's an issue for them. They have to get, uh, uh, they're doing things to, to address inflation because the job market is so tight. There's an extremely high standard of living in Singapore. As a matter of fact, the per capita GDP is very close to that of the United States. Uh, they have um, uh, freedoms that did not exist, uh, 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 weren't even close to in existence in the, the regimes that we now see uh, under pressure uh, in, uh, in the Arab world. It's, it's an entirely different situation, Chris. Yeah, and let me come back to something. You referenced now, uh, Singapore came out of whatever this global recession was first, and we're, I think we're still in the United States trying to figure out what that recession is, are we out of it? Is it a recession or is it some kind of game changer or secular change? But what is, what do you see when you see, when you read the economic indicators, not just in Singapore, Ambassador, but uh, some of the economic indicators in the Southeast Asian Rim and the Pacific Rim, do you see, what do you see for the next five years? Well, I see continued growth, uh, phenomenal growth, and what that means to me as the U.S. ambassador serving in Southeast Asia and Singapore is great opportunity. And one of the reasons we thought it was so important to go on these missions back to the United States to talk with American businesses is uh, American businesses, uh, especially recently, have been underperforming. And let me give you a, a you know a few you know very basic statistics that that I, that to me uh, are very compelling. First, uh, ninety five percent of the people in the world live outside the United States. Uh, sometimes it comes as a surprise to the <laughs> other uh, five percent, and seventy percent of the purchasing power is outside of the United States. Uh, despite uh, some of the confusion in the headlines, America remains the number one manufacturing mm -hmm. economy in the world, with by far the largest economy, $15 trillion annual GDP, almost three times that the size of China, which is the second largest uh, economy. We're growing at about 4% a year. We think 2011, that that will be the number. So it's in the right direction. We're out of the recession, any economist would agree. Uh, but we're not growing at a fast enough rate to claw back some of those, those lost American jobs. And when President Obama wakes up every morning, no matter what's going on in the world, I can tell you he thinks about American jobs and how to regain and recapture some of those jobs that were lost in 2007 and 2008. And Asia, especially Southeast Asia, I think, represents a great opportunity. And then I'll leave you with this very important statistic about American underperformance with regard to exports, which gives us so much opportunity in Southeast Asia and in all of Asia. Less than 1%, less than 1% of American businesses have ever exported anywhere. And of that, less than 1%, the vast majority have exported to only a single country, probably Canada or Mexico for obvious reasons. Uh, the chairman and CEO of Nucor sat on this program not long ago and said it is not fair out there. And, and, and he was particularly looking at China and said, when we try to sell our steel on the world market, China doesn't play fair, and we can list a thousand ways. And I'm not picking on, on, on China, but since you are in the region and you talk about exporting and you talk about jobs, what is it in, in the United States we have this idea about preserving jobs or keeping jobs here? Are we missing something by not embracing maybe a more liberal trade policy? Are we missing something here? Well, I don't know if we're missing something. I'm a free trader. And I think the President of the United States is a free and fair trader. That may have been uh, what the CEO was talking about. 
Uh, we um, uh, took the very significant step of engaging in the Trans-Pacific Partnership mm -hmm. negotiations. Uh, shortly after the president was elected, uh, the United States said, we're going to join the talks about what ultimately, and, and uh, uh, to be clear, uh, as you know, free trade agreements are difficult to do and the politics in the U.S. is very difficult, which I think is your reference. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but, but we've made the decision to engage in what ultimately could, could develop into a free trade area for all of the Pacific. Uh, one of the things that's become very clear, I said things have become very clear uh, since we moved 9,000 miles from the United States. One of the things that's become so clear, and it shouldn't come as a surprise, but it's good to see, is that Made in America is very powerful in Asia. How so? Uh, the, the prestige and the, the, the way uh, Asian consumers favor American products. They know our products are the safest and they know that they're the best and very often they're at the leading edge of technology. And uh, part of what we're doing here in North Carolina is, 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 is passing that on to North Carolina and South Carolina businesses uh, that their products are very attractive to Asian consumers and very often Asian consumers will pay a premium for American products and services. And while Asia's far away, and American businesses have not really had to export in the past. We've built the most wealthy country in the history of the world really by focusing on domestic markets. I think those times have changed, and we need to look abroad in a more comprehensive way, which is why the president a year ago in his first State of the Union address in January of 2010 announced the National Export Initiative, the NEI, with mm -hmm. the ambitious goal of doubling U.S. exports within five years. He recognizes that American products uh, are very attractive to consumers around the world and that by promoting American exports will protect the good American jobs that are here and will reclaim some of the lost American jobs. You know, Manufacturing jobs in the United States associated with exports pay 15% more than any other jobs. And the Carolinas have done a good job. Uh, one out of every five manufacturing jobs in North Carolina is associated with American exports. And the number's even better in South Carolina, where one out of every four manufacturing jobs uh, is associated with exports. Mm -hmm. But we need to increase that number. Uh, only 11% of the American economy, that massive uh, American economy, is made up of exports, which is uh, the lowest of all of the developed economies. I, I want to come back to this, this idea of the NEI uh, and, and the corpus of that and, and how the program is built and what the assumptions are around that. Um, uh, if you've just joined us, we are talking with the uh, Honorable David Edelman. He is the uh, American ambassador to Singapore, a former state senator from Georgia, a former, uh, a long time ago, assistant attorney general in, in the state of uh, Georgia, and we're glad to have him back here. If you have a comment or would like to watch this program or comment on this program, go to carolinabusinessreview.com. It's one long, not very uh, slick word, but you get the point. Um, Ambassador, coming back to this whole notion of uh, the NEI, what are the assumptions to promote? How do you, I mean, the, the dramatic uh, increase in, in exports over five years is a pretty big push. What's the assumption that we can get there? Well, there, there are a few assumptions. One, as I've said, American products and American innovation is the envy of the world. Uh, second, uh, necessity is the mother of uh, invention, mm -hmm. uh, as we know. And I think uh, we've learned a lesson from the uh, American recession, and that is American businesses uh, need to go abroad. Something very significant happened in March of 2010. For the first time in history, U.S. exports to Asia exceeded U.S. exports to Europe. And I would suggest to you and your viewers that that's not likely to reverse during our lifetimes. So the president has turned his full attention to Asia and the commercial engagement in Asia. American businesses, the large ones, uh, have been doing that for some time. And now I think it's time for the small and medium-sized businesses to more fully engage in Asian markets. And that's the fundamental premise that underlies the National Export Initiative, that if we can get America's medium and small businesses especially to fully engage in the Asian markets, we can double U.S. exports. And I'd add, after mm -hmm. only one year, 
uh, and it's barely been a year, uh, we're, we're not only on track, but we're ahead of track. Uh, American uh, exports are up more than 20%. If we continue at this pace, we'll uh, easily exceed the doubling uh, that the president set out in his State of the Union. And I'd add that, that uh, U.S. exports to Asia in that uh, first year after the NEI was announced are up more than 30%. The growing Asian markets, of course, are going to need to outperform uh, the other markets. I think uh, we may need to quadruple U.S. exports so, to Southeast Asia. So is it, do you think most of the increase is because of an intense, an intention, intentional push, or is there growth? There's obviously growth in the global economy that has aided that as well. Well, I think it's both. Uh, I think you have to give uh, the president credit for his leadership, and you, of course, have to give credit to American businesses uh, who, on their own, have found that bringing goods and services to the Asian markets is the way to deliver returns for their shareholders. We've got about five minutes left, and I do want to come back to this whole notion that, you, that you've mentioned a couple of times now, that you got, you've kind of been able to back up from the U.S. and some of the challenges that we have to the tune of about a 9,000 mile view that you have now um, with your former state Senate background in Georgia and you hear some of the same dialogue and might even be engaged in some of this ambassador when we talk about health care, when we talk about jobs. What would you say to your former colleagues in Georgia and some of the states like North and South Carolina that have billions of dollars in shortfall, how would you tell them to proceed? Well, that's a big question with only five <laughs> minutes left. Uh, I, I think, you know, my advice uh, to, let's just say, state lawmakers uh, would be to put aside uh, the petty politics, put aside the intramurals. Uh, the, this is, as the president has said, the Sputnik uh, moment for the United States. And I think what he was talking about is we need uh, a new day for American innovation. We know we have the best system in the world. It's not a coincidence Bill Gates and Steve Jobs are both Americans. Uh, we have the finest higher education institutions in the world, some of uh, which we visited at the Research Triangle uh, mm -hmm. area here in North Carolina earlier this week. Uh, we've got space for entrepreneurs. We have a pure capitalist uh, system. And the states and state lawmakers and, and candidly the politicians in our nation's capital, I think, need to stay focused externally. To, to keep uh, uh, that, um, to leverage on that great uh, ability of Americans to innovate and to assist Americans in bringing those goods and products to these uh, increasingly important foreign markets, especially in Asia. So how, how does a, a state lawmaker, how do, uh, I guess what does political courage look like these days when, <laughs> when you know that you have to take a hit and someone's going to have to take a bullet for the team? Well, I don't know about taking bullets for the team. I think Americans, and I think American voters are really smart, and I think they will reward uh, responsible behavior. Here in North Carolina or in, in South Carolina, I think if you have lawmakers uh, who are taking their cues, for example, from uh, the business community mm -hmm. and helping uh, create hospitable business climate for foreign direct investment in the United States, which we've done a pretty good job with historically, but also promoting products in the uh, markets beyond our shores, I think they'll be rewarded uh, politically. Mm -hmm. Too much of the focus, frankly, has been internal. And I think the time has come for Americans to band together uh, the way we have done in the past in our great uh, generations and uh, contribute to the American economic recovery by creating the conditions here for American innovators and American businesses and helping to promote those products uh, abroad. I can tell you that's the number one goal for our embassy team in Singapore. That's a good way to end. And, and I do have to ask you this last thing. You spent so many years in Georgia as, as a lawmaker and a public policymaker and, and an attorney. But your family is in Buford County in South Carolina, so, so which one is it? Is it Georgia <laughs> or South Carolina? Well, I'm an American, and, and, <laughs> and, 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 I'll, and I'll tell you this. Uh, you know, I said uh, this has been a magnificent experience representing the United States in Southeast Asia, and I did not know it was possible for me to be more proud to be an American. But having represented us in Southeast Asia, I have an even deeper pride. Uh, the last word and a good one to end on. Thank you, Ambassador. Good to have you here. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you for watching. Until next week, good night.
Major funding for Carolina Business Review provided by Grant Thornton, an international accounting, tax, and business advisory organization dedicated to serving middle market companies. Grant Thornton, a passion for the business of accounting. And by Novant Health, a not-for-profit group of hospitals and physician clinics, ranked as one of our nation's 10 best health care systems, caring for patients and communities in North and South Carolina. Major funding also by King and Spalding, an international law firm with over 800 lawyers in 13 offices worldwide, providing legal services to clients in the Carolinas and throughout the world. For more information, visit www.kslaw.com. Additional funding provided by Business North Carolina Magazine. There's a place for those who subscribe to the theory that business doesn't have to be boring. And by Sunoco, a global manufacturer of consumer and industrial packaging products and provider of packaging services. With more than 300 operations in 35 countries, headquartered in Hartsville since 1899. And by viewers like you. Thank you. Web design, media strategy, and email marketing services by CC Communications. You may write us at Carolina Business Review, 3242 Commonwealth Avenue, Charlotte, North Carolina, 28205.